It is good to be with you tonight, and I am looking forward to being with you again this coming Sunday at 9.30 for our study of 1 Timothy, and then for 10.30 as well for worship. And I know, at least for me, one of the highlights of the past few weeks has been our singing. We've been able to do a lot more singing than we've been able to do over the past two years, and I really appreciate that. And so I'm looking forward to, again, doing some more singing this week and being together with all of you. Uh, several of you have asked some very good follow-up questions concerning our study of the rich man and Lazarus, so some very good things that I'm sure others are thinking and wondering about. And so I'm kind of tentatively planning on going back and deviating from what I planned this week so that we can pay more attention to some of those very good questions that have come up over the past three weeks. And so if you have any thoughts about our study of the rich man and Lazarus over the past few weeks, I would love to hear from you right away, uh, as in tonight, Wednesday. I usually spend uh, Thursday, Friday, and about half a Saturday getting ready for Sunday. But I'm uh, looking forward to seeing all of you this coming Sunday at 9.30 and 10.30. So hope to see you there at the Four Lakes Congregation, 302 Acewood. Looking forward to being there in person again with you this coming Sunday. Tonight we are continuing in our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible, and again we are just hitting the highlights here. We're doing an overview in between our study of Acts and the book of Genesis. This study is something of a buffer between those two books, which are rather large, and so we're doing a few weeks here in between. And to help us keep on track, to give us a sense of direction, We've been putting a very brief, very rough outline on the side of the screen here. We started a few weeks ago with the basics, defining a prophet as someone who's a spokesperson for God and sometimes has the ability to foretell the future. We then looked at some principles of predictive prophecy. It's more than good guesswork. It is specific and so on. <clears throat> it has to be accurate in its uh, fulfillment and so on. Uh, we then went on to start looking at some examples of prophecy. We started with some uh, national prophecies, nations like Egypt and Rome and Babylon. We then moved on to some prophecies about individuals. Uh, we focused on Abraham and Isaac. Then we looked at Joseph, Jacob, Joshua. Then we looked at uh, Agabus in the New Testament in the book of Acts. We then looked at some prophecies concerning God's kingdom, the church. And we noted that Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So that was a very easy way of remembering that. Uh, last week, we started looking at some prophecies concerning Jesus. We introduced some of those prophecies by looking at the first of all Bible prophecies in Genesis 3.15. And then we learned that both Jesus and the apostles often mention prophecy as they taught Jesus as being the Messiah, so the fulfillment of those prophecies. So they basically said, this is what the prophet said, this is what we see in the life of Jesus, therefore this is how Jesus is the fulfillment of these prophecies. And then we looked at several examples of prophecy concerning the Lord's birth. So if you remember last week, if you were with us, we looked at the place of his birth being Bethlehem, uh, we looked at the fact that he would be born to a virgin, which obviously is very unique. It is the most unique thing that has ever happened in world history. Uh, we looked at the name that he would be given, the fact that he would be called out of Egypt, and the fact that other children would be murdered around the time of his birth. All of those things are the fulfillment of various prophecies. Well, tonight we continue on with some prophecies about Jesus, and as you may be able to see on the screen, uh, we are dividing this into two more lessons. So tonight we'll look at the, some prophecies concerning the Lord's life and his ministry, and the next week we hope to wrap it up with the uh, prophecies concerning his death and resurrection. So this is where we are tonight, his life and his ministry. And then next week, we will head toward the prophecies concerning his death and his resurrection. Well, tonight, almost as a transition between last week and this week, let's start uh, right before Jesus' earthly ministry begins. And, and we're doing this because Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would have a forerunner. So this is, you'll see how this is kind of in between. This is not dealing with the Lord as an, as an infant. This is nothing about his birth, but it's not quite to his actual ministry. This is... Uh, describing John as his forerunner. So we'll start tonight then with this prophecy made by Isaiah. And this goes back to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. And um, this one has some powerful implications as to who Jesus actually is. And so let's notice Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3, 4, and 5. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then let's turn over briefly to the fulfillment of this prophecy. If you have a footnote here in Isaiah, you may notice that it points over to Matthew chapter 3. 
verses 1, 2, and 3. So this is where we are headed. This is the fulfillment of it. So Matthew 3, 1, 2, and 3. Matthew says, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Well, obviously, we have a few things going on here, uh, starting with a very clear example of an inspired apostle, Matthew, applying Isaiah by pointing out concerning John, this is the one referred to by Isaiah in the prophets. And so um, this isn't a matter of us saying, well, this seems to fit, therefore this is a fulfillment of prophecy, but rather this is an inspired writer saying, this is the one. This is the fulfillment of what Isaiah has said. So John then is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And remember what, remember what we noted last week, that Matthew does this far more often than anyone else. Often Matthew will say, this is what was spoken of through the prophet and, and so on. And then he will quote the prophecy. And he does this because he's writing to the Jewish people. If you remember when we studied the gospel accounts, Oh, we've studied all four of these together through uh, through the years, but uh, uh, Matthew has a specific audience. He is writing to the Jewish people, and a lot of people think that Matthew, the book, uh, might have been a textbook for their like Bible class program, basically, there at the uh, Jerusalem congregation. So they needed something in writing to teach the Jewish people concerning who Jesus really is, and uh, Matthew wrote this book as something of a guide. And so Matthew is a Jewish man writing to other Jews. And so we noted last week, the Jews care about this kind of thing. They care about Isaiah, and this is very important to them. And uh, Mark and Luke, though, they pay less attention to this uh, being the fulfillment of prophecy. Not that it's not important, but uh, Mark was writing to uh, the Romans. Luke was writing to the Gentiles, and they really didn't uh, care as much about it as the Jewish people did. So not that they ignore it. We'll see a time or two tonight. We're going to go over into those accounts. Uh, but for Matthew writing to Jews, this is especially important. And so over and over and over again, Matthew will say, this is what was spoken of uh, through the prophet Isaiah or whoever. So Mark and Luke are writing to a different crowd, and uh, they aren't really as concerned about this as Matthew is. Now, what is uh, really powerful about these two passages? Notice in Isaiah 40, Isaiah says that somebody would be coming to prepare the way for the Lord. And this was a, a common uh, practice back in the ancient world where they would have like this advanced team that would go before a king and they'd arrive a few weeks earlier and they would kind of make sure everything was all lined up. I think, you know, the Secret Service would uh, do a similar thing today with the president if he's visiting some foreign city, as I think he's on his way to do. Uh, they'll get there early and this event would have been planned out for many weeks, if not months or a year or more. And they'd get everything safe, they'd get the hotel arrangements, the security, all that lined up. Well, this is basically what is being referred to here. And so somebody would be coming to prepare the way for the Lord. Well, the word Lord in this passage, you'll notice, is in all caps. And if you may remember, in most modern translations, Lord in all caps is how they handle the word uh, that we would uh, probably pronounce as Yahweh. It is, I believe it's called a tetragrammaton. It's a word with four consonants and no vowels. And that's hard to pronounce. In fact, it is pretty much impossible. We don't really know how to pronounce it for sure. Uh, but it is God's personal name, most likely Yahweh, maybe Jehovah. Or, uh, it, you know, you take four consonants without vowels. You kind of got to insert the vowels your, yourself and kind of figure it out. Um, but, but just notice, uh, this is God's personal name. And, and note here, someone would be preparing the way for Yahweh. Not just Lord as in Master, but there's a person out there in the future who would come to this earth to prepare the way for Yahweh himself. And um, in Matthew, Matthew then applies this to John the Immerser or John the Baptist, as he's often referred to. So John then would be preparing the way for Yahweh. Well, we know, though, that John is really preparing the way for Jesus, isn't he? And so what we learn from this, then, is Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the one that uh, John is preparing the way for. So this is absolutely huge in terms of uh, prophecy. I know today several religious groups teach that Jesus was a created being, that he is not God, but that he is 
uh, like an angel. He was a messenger created by God for a special reason or whatever, but that he is not actually God. Uh, the, so, the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses teach this, which is rather ironic, as I think you'll note in just a moment. Uh, but in conversations on our front porch several times through the years, I have asked them to look at uh, Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 in their own translation. They have their own translation. It's weird in some ways. Um, but they actually have the word Jehovah in verse 3, if I remember it correctly. I've got it over here in my office. I didn't look at it before tonight's class. I know I've looked at it on my front porch time and time again. Uh, but then I'll have them turn over and look at the fulfillment of that passage over in Matthew 3. And I'll straight up ask them, you know, who was John preparing the way for in this passage? And the answer, obviously, is Jesus. Well, Isaiah predicted that he was preparing the way for Yahweh. Well, the only conclusion here that we can come to is that Jesus and Yahweh, Jesus and Jehovah, are one and the same. Otherwise, Matthew made a mistake by applying this prophecy to Jesus, and I have not yet heard a good explanation for this. They really, at least in my personal experience, have not had a good answer for this, but, but I'll explain this to them. You know, this right here, these two passages, the prophecy and its fulfillment, uh, these are two good reasons why we worship Jesus as God, because he is God. He is more than an angel. He is uh, Yahweh. Jesus is Jehovah. He is absolutely more than a created being. So I hope we understand that this has some very practical implications today. So this study of prophecy uh, has uh, some very good reasons to look into it. Well, let's move on tonight uh, to look at a passage in Luke 4 where Jesus begins his public ministry. So we're leaving Matthew surprisingly so early. We're kind of keeping this in chronological order if we can. Oh, but it's a dramatic passage where he quotes from Isaiah chapter 61. So if you don't have the ability to see it on the screen, if you're listening on the phone tonight, uh, this is Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 14 down through verse 24, actually. So Luke 4, 14 through 24. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread uh, all through the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. A few things here, but let's note here at the beginning that uh, the custom in the ancient synagogues was for the teacher to stand up and to read the word of God publicly. And then the custom was for the teacher to sit down and explain it. And remember, we used to sit down as Bible class teachers at the Four Lakes Congregation. I think it got a little bit easier just to deal with the podium, with the live stream and the microphone switching and that kind of thing. So I've just been uh, continuing on from, from the podium on Sundays and as our Bible class teachers have as well. Uh, but this is what happens here. So they stood up to actually read the Word of God, then they would sit down to teach the Word. And at this point, um, you know, that's their custom. So the attendant hands the book of Isaiah to Jesus. And Isaiah is a pretty large book as far as books of the Bible go. It's one of the longest books, 66 chapters long as we have divided it today. Uh, in a scroll, this would have been a piece of papyrus, a piece of paper, um, probably 30 to 40 feet long, perhaps, um, especially if it was kind of a public copy like that in a synagogue. So 30 to 40 foot long piece of paper rolled up between two spindles. So I'm thinking almost the size of like a, uh, a roll of paper towels, if we want to compare it to that. I haven't rolled out the whole roll to see how long it is, but kind of a, a similar thing, like a roll of paper towels with two spindles. 
And the attendant then hands this scroll to Jesus, and Jesus literally scrolls over to Isaiah 61, doesn't he? So that's near the end of the book. So, so we scroll today also, don't we? Um, Jesus also scrolled. I think our scrolling is a little bit different with a mouse or a touchpad or, or something like that. But Jesus scrolls over to Isaiah 61 near the end of the book. And uh, so he would have rotated both spindles. If you can imagine this, he's, you know, rotate, 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 you know, like the old microfilm type readers for uh, the, the old people in the audience tonight. Uh, so rolling that over to Isaiah chapter 61. So he doesn't just let the book fall open, I guess is what we would say today, but he knows where he is going. He knows the book of Isaiah. He is familiar with it. And so he gets up, he scrolls to this passage, he reads it publicly, and then he sits down. And everybody is watching and waiting to see what he'll say next. What's he going to say about this passage? So he reads the scripture, he sits down, there's that kind of brief moment of kind of heavy silence there, and he simply says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now that is a rather short sermon, isn't it? That's a very short explanation of a very deep passage. But it's also an incredibly bold claim, isn't it? He's basically saying, I am the fulfillment of this passage. And I say this especially because of the pronouns in this passage. Pronouns can be very important. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and so on. So Jesus is referring to himself here. And he says, today, this scripture, referring to me, is what he's saying, has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, in response to this, some are amazed at his words. Oh, wow, yes, this is amazing. But others are a little bit confused, asking, is this not Joseph's son? In other words, as I see this, they cannot reconcile in their minds how Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy, while at the same time being the kid who grew up down the street or in the next village over or whatever. that This doesn't make sense. How could Jesus be the fulfillment of this? We know who he is. We know his uh, mom and dad, and we know his brothers and sisters and so on. Well, Jesus goes on to make a prediction of his own, saying, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Well, I don't see the fulfillment of that scripture, specifically elsewhere in scripture. I don't doubt that it is fulfilled. We just don't have the record of it being fulfilled word for word. But I personally see it fulfilled in Matthew 27, 42. Matthew 27, 42. That's where the people are mocking Jesus on the cross. And if you remember, they were saying he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Do you see the parallel there? If you are who you claim you are, then fix this. That's basically what Jesus is predicting that they will say at one moment. And so his conclusion in this passage, though, is that no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. So he can go to other places. People are amazed, the ooh and ah, and they believe and, and turn to him and faith and all that. But the people in Galilee, for the most part, will always have a hang up. They will always stumble over the fact that they knew Jesus as a young man, and it is more difficult for them to believe. And this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, for us and for our study tonight, we just need to note that this is how Jesus starts his earthly ministry around the age of 30. He's a carpenter, trained as a carpenter by his earthly father, Joseph. Suddenly, he walks into the synagogue, as was his custom. That's an interesting lesson we can learn from this. Jesus was in the habit of going to the synagogue on a regular basis. Only this time, he quotes from Isaiah 61. He claims to be the fulfillment of that prophecy. So he will preach the gospel to the poor. He will proclaim release to the captives. He will heal the blind. He will set free those who are oppressed. And he will proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So that is a bold claim to claim to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. So he set the bar high. It's almost like a pre-fulfillment. He's bringing the prophecy up to date and saying, um, this is it, that you're about to see or you are looking now at the fulfillment of Isaiah. Well, the next passage comes in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. This comes right after Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. So, uh, he, uh, he fasts for 40 days. Satan tempts him, turning the stones to bread, uh, jumping off the pinnacle of the temple and all that. And uh, this is where we pick up. This is Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. 
Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the point of this passage is that Jesus heads up to Galilee. Matthew points out that this uh, fulfills the prophecy from Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, where the prophet had predicted that the people up in Galilee would see this great light and so on. So Jesus beginning his ministry in that place is a, certainly a fulfillment of that prophecy. Nobody really could have predicted that the Messiah would come from a place like that. Kind of like with him being born in Bethlehem. That didn't make sense. That was a little village. Uh, it was not famous for anything. They would have expected him to be born and come from somewhere like Jerusalem, but that's not exactly what happened. Okay, let's continue in Matthew, where Matthew quotes another passage from Isaiah. And this is Matthew 12, verses 9 through 21. Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable, then, is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all, and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out, until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. So again, just in context, Jesus is teaching in the synagogues. This is what he often did. Only this time, he actually heals a man on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees try to destroy him over this, that he is promoting work on the Sabbath, like he's being a doctor, doing hard work kind of thing. But Jesus gets out of town, kind of slips away, <clears throat> gets out of there. He goes back to keeping a rather low profile for the moment. And then Matthew applies this, and he says this was to fulfill what was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 42. And then he quotes this passage from Isaiah. And again, this is a, a feature of Matthew, isn't it? To show something Jesus does, and then to go back and to explain how it is a fulfillment of prophecy. And here the prophecy is that the Messiah would not be a typical king who would come in conquering. This is not... Uh, Savior, Messiah, Christ, who would come in with a sword on a, a horse and, uh, you know, slaying people left and right, taking over Israel, taking it back from the Romans, that kind of thing. This is not who he is. But rather, he would be a servant. He would not be known for fighting and yelling and shouting, but rather, he would be gentle. And I think we need to note here that gentleness is simply power under control. Not that Jesus was wimpy. He was not. Uh, but his power was under control, and he used it for good in a calm, gentle way. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. In other words, Jesus would pay special attention to the poor and to those who were suffering. He wouldn't beat them down any further. You know, how dare you get in a position like that? I can't believe you did something so uh, stupid to land you in poverty. That's not what Jesus was doing. That was not what he was about. Uh, but he would encourage them and he would lift them up. And Matthew says that what Jesus does to the man with the withered hand is a fulfillment of this prophecy. And I often think about this today when I'm working in the garden, you know, I'm pruning and here's a, you know, a, a limp reed or a withered something. I'm like, oh, <laughs> what, you know, the what would Jesus do? It kind of 
I, anyway, maybe I'm just weird on that, but I, it's just kind of strange to me. It, it reminds me of the Bible, so I guess in that sense, it is it is a good thing. And one thing I noted, um, he, he healed the guy's hand to make it look like the other. Over the past month or so, I've been watching some uh, basically ER show from London, like inner city, I think A&E, um, accident and emergency. And I've noticed on a lot of the injuries where somebody has something out of joint or broken or swollen, a lot of time they will compare like, you know, the right finger to the left finger, hold them up, and then they can see clearly what the problem is. And I just noted that here, that uh, Jesus healed this man so that one hand looked like the other. And I thought that was just kind of an interesting thing, uh, especially, you know, thinking about doctors today doing the same thing. But uh, nevertheless, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, there are other prophecies predicting various healings. We think of passages like Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 where the prophet says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. Well, I, this is almost, as a prophecy, it's almost a, a checklist, isn't it? It's almost just a perfect summary of Jesus' healings during his ministry. I mean, even without matching this up to various passages in the gospel accounts, I don't even think we need to do that. I think most of us understand that Jesus did, in fact, heal the blind. He restored hearing. He did cause those who couldn't walk to jump around. He did restore speech to those who couldn't talk. I mean, just on and on and on. And the point here is Isaiah, he could see this coming. It's like the door cracked open a bit. He could see through it. He could see that the Messiah would do some amazing things. So he didn't have every detail, uh, but he absolutely could see bits and pieces of the Messiah out there on the horizon. Well, let's go back to Matthew again to Matthew chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. And this has to do more with his teaching style and the way that he taught people. So this is Matthew 13, 33 through 35. And this is a quote from Psalm number 78. But uh, the whole passage is Matthew 13, 33 through 35. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. So Matthew is simply saying here that Jesus speaking in parables is a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus was known for doing this. He went around uh, not quoting other rabbis. That's what rabbis would do. They would speak almost like a term paper, as so-and-so said, blah, blah, blah. And But then as Dr. So-and-so, and they would just be like quoting, 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 uh, like a master's thesis or something. Uh, but Jesus didn't talk like that. He didn't uh, talk in a way that was over the heads of the common people, but he spoke in simple language. He used word pictures or these parables. Uh, these uh, parallel type stories. Uh, speaking of parables, and to give an example, let's turn over to Matthew 21. This is Matthew 21, 33 through 46. So I know it's a bigger chunk of scripture here. It may be hard to read on the screen, but uh, instead of chopping it up, it's all here. Uh, but feel free to look this up on your own. I've uh, given you plenty of time. And uh, most of you are fast. If you're in this class tonight, you are fast at looking up stuff. I can almost guarantee that you're, you're there by now. But Matthew 21, 33 through 46. And this is where Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds of the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected 
This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. We have a few things to note here, starting with the fact that Jesus gives yet another parable fulfilling that last prophecy we just looked at from Psalm 78, that he would come speaking in parables. But here, in speaking a parable, Jesus also quotes another prophecy. So we have a prophecy inside a parable, which itself is a fulfillment of prophecy. And this quote comes from Psalm 118. He very clearly applies this prophecy to himself, and he quotes it um, in the form of what is basically an insult to the religious leaders. Did you never read in the scriptures? Can you imagine saying that? It's like to a preacher, right? To somebody who should know what they're talking about. And he's he says this a lot in his ministry. Have you never read? Have you not heard? And uh, so it comes across almost as an insult, not to those who couldn't read. He wasn't, you know, insulting the illiterate. He, he was talking to the, the PhD types here, the experts in religion. And basically, how could you be so dense as to miss that I am the fulfillment of this prophecy? That's what he's saying here. And he applies it by saying, God will take the kingdom of God, therefore, away from them, and he will give it to the Gentiles, the people. It's a common way of referring to the Gentiles. So a complete, total insult to the Jewish leaders. And they get it, don't they? They understand. This is not hard for them to get. They get what he's saying. However, instead of arguing with his application of that prophecy by giving reasons why he is not the fulfillment of prophecy, they can't do that, do they? They can't argue with what Jesus says here. And so they try to take him by force. And at the end of it here, we've got another aspect of this. As Matthew explains that they wanted to take him by force, but they couldn't. Uh, they're terrified of Jesus because of the people. They considered him to be a prophet. And so in this passage, we have Jesus speaking in parables, which is a fulfillment of prophecy itself. And in this parable, he quotes a prophecy, applying it to himself, and at the end, we find that the people think of Jesus as being a prophet. And so that's kind of cool to me. We have three aspects of prophecy all rolled into one on, on this one. Well, we're almost to the end of tonight's study. And I think we're done maybe a tiny bit early. But we uh, do have a brief reference to prophecy outside the book of Matthew. This is in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. John 2, 13 through 17. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And so this is just a reminder that gentleness does not equal weakness, does it? Not at all. Just because Jesus is compassionate doesn't mean that he couldn't get it done. Doesn't mean that he couldn't wreak havoc as needed. And that is what is needed. That's what we see here. This is the first of two times that Jesus cleanses the temple. Once here at the beginning of his ministry and then again toward the end of his ministry. But here the first time it happens. It made the disciples think back to that prophecy from Psalm 69, verse 9. Zeal for your house will consume me. They saw this as being a fulfillment of prophecy. Can you imagine that? Being the apostles, standing over to the side, and their boss, Jesus, their teacher, goes in, and he is physically violent, throwing over the tables of some very influential, wealthy people. And this is the passage that comes to mind. This, what he's doing right here, this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Well, this brings us to the end of tonight's study. We'll leave it here. We'll plan on picking up next week if the Lord wills with some prophecies concerning the Lord's death and resurrection. If we need to divide that one into two more classes, we will. At this point, I'm planning on getting it done in one. I don't want to keep you there for an hour and a half or whatever, so we'll be mindful of our time. Uh, by the way, as I've mentioned before, we are heading toward Genesis, so I just want to encourage you as we get closer to that to take some time to either read or listen to the book of Genesis over the next week or two. 
I started preparing for our study of Genesis several months ago, and I decided to listen to the book all at once. And I did that on my trip down to Tennessee for the Fried Hardeman Lectures back in February. And as I remember it, I hit the play button on the app on the phone uh, somewhere just south of St. Louis. And I listened to Genesis for the next three and a half hours through the rest of Missouri and then on into Tennessee toward Jackson. And it was it was a great experience if you've never done that. Just listen to the whole book, the book of Genesis, all 50 chapters all at once. Uh, it was quite a bit more exciting than I remembered it. Uh, I saw God in the book of Genesis more than I did previously. It is a book of action. Uh, it is a book of great faith. I know it takes about 80 hours to read the entire Bible from cover to cover. So if you want, it's like a work week, two work weeks if you're slacking. And, um, but about 80 hours to read through the whole Bible cover to cover. Take a vacation, take two weeks of vacation and just do the Bible when you would have gone to work. I've, I've had people do that. I know... Uh, that's been done before. But the Genesis is, I'm just saying, is only about three and a half hours of that. And so if you have a chance, if you've got three and a half hours over the next couple of weeks, I would just highly recommend sitting down or, or standing or walking or, and some of you have the ability to do that while swimming. You know, I've got earplugs that'll play through your head and stuff. So anyway, we have no excuse for not listening to or paying attention to the word of God. But uh, my suggestion is to uh, listen or read to Genesis straight through with no interruption uh, sometime over the next couple weeks. And I guarantee you will be blessed for doing that. Hope to see you this Sunday at 930 and 1030. But as we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the creator of heaven and earth. Tonight, we're thankful for Jesus as the perfect fulfillment of prophecy. You knew what you were planning all along. You cracked that door open just a little bit for your prophets to peek through, and they did. They could see little slivers of light in the hope of the coming of the Messiah. In his birth and life, we've seen Jesus as the perfect fulfillment of those predictions that they made. Some of those who saw your son face to face believed, but others hardened their hearts against what they could see with their own eyes. Father, we pray that we would be among those who believe. We're so thankful for your perfect word. We ask, Father, that you would be with those who are struggling tonight. Some are facing difficult times physically. Others are struggling emotionally. Some are struggling spiritually. Father, we ask for your help as we encourage each other. You are the God of all comfort, and you have put us in your family, the church, for a reason, so that we can learn to love each other and take care of each other. Open our eyes to the pain that we see around us. Give us opportunities to help. We come to you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.